we welcome you to worship today. And as we do so, we acknowledge that Calvary United Church stands on Treaty 6 territory. We pay our respects to our elders, both past and present, wherever we find ourselves this morning. We recommit to our status as an affirming ministry within the United Church of Canada and strive to be an open-minded, inclusive, and welcoming place of worship. It is our deepest hope that all people might feel at home in this space, and we give thanks to God for this Sabbath day where we join our hearts and minds in prayer. A reading from the Gospel of John. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples enter. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. When Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked him, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. And again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these people go. This was to fulfill the words that had been spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. I, I am not to drink the cup that the Father has given me. So the soldiers and the officers and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. They took him to Ananias, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised that the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people.
this day we remember that he was betrayed by his friends and arrested. This day we remember the crowd turned against him and he was tried. This day we remember he was abandoned, judged, and mocked. This day we remember he was denied, he was beaten, he was hung on a cross. This day we remember he died thirsting, in pain, and yet still pouring out grace. As we approach this crucifixion place, will we be like the others that could not watch? Or will we be bold enough to stand and mourn at his feet? With courage like our Jesus, we will stand and face the, this crucifixion place with love at the center of our hearts. Let us pray. Our God, God who died on a cross for us, God who was mocked, God who thirsted, God whose mother wept for her firstborn child, you are with us now, offering us grace, just as you did from the cross. On this day, our hearts are filled with grief. Our minds are heavy with understanding of your suffering, of our world's suffering. What can we say, God? Each year we sit here hoping that we have the courage to face this story and hoping that we can change it. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 18. Simon Peter and the other disciples followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the highest priests, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of the ma that man's disciples, are you? He, uh, he said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter was also standing with them and warming himself. Oh. 
will enter a time of prayer of confession. Powerful, merciful creator, we gather in the shadow of your son's cross, in the darkness of the betrayal and abandonment that Jesus faced in his last moments on this earth. You will sacrifice so much for us with grace and grief laying down your life so that we might be saved and know your everlasting love. Jesus died for us, yet, like the friends that abandoned him, we look away and hide when life is hard and our reputation is at stake. We, like the Romans, speak words and live out actions that cause harm to other humans. We, like Pilate, are swayed to make choices with consequences far greater than we can know. We, like the crowd, stand silent in the face of justice failing. We wait for permission to speak. Instead of standing boldly, we wait meekly on the sidelines. We fall short of Jesus' teachings, God. We fall short of what you ask of us. And for that, we confess to you our shortcomings. God knows all of our failings and yet still sent a son to save us. In his life and his death was able to show us a path to the kingdom of God. In the shadows of his death, Jesus continued to be filled with grace, with light and with truth. Within those gifts, with the Creator's love and forgiveness, which is poured out upon each of us now and forever, God's mercy will last forever. We are truly forgiven this day and always. Thanks be to God. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 18. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his, about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. If I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Aeneas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, and they asked, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose Peter, ear Peter cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? And again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate, to his headquarters. It was early in the morning, and they themselves did not enter the headquarters as to avoid the ritual defilement and to be able to eat at the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death that he was to die. When Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom belonged to this world, 
My followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So are you a king? Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you this king of Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a rebel. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he claimed to be the Son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but Jesus cried out, If you release this man, you are no... The Jews cried out, If you... Release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. And they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. And then handed him over to them to be crucified. Did Jesus really know how it would all play out that day? Did he know from the moment that he arrived at the gates of Jerusalem on a donkey, as he broke the bread at supper? Was grief gathering in his heart as he talked and prayed and ate with his friends and family that night? When he went to pray in the garden, were the words lifted to his parent God, words of grief and anguish for himself, And for his companions, he predicted that he would be abandoned, denied, and killed in the days leading up to the guards arriving, leading up to the kiss, to the arrest. Was Jesus' stomach heavy with a stone that grief tends to deposit when he saw his friend coming to serve him into the hands of those that would kill him? When did the others there start to feel that grief? 
the grief that we all sit with today? Was it not until the crowd turned against him when they were shouting, crucify? Did their hearts become heavy when he was mocked and dressed and beaten? Or not until he cried out in thirst and died with sour wine on his lips? Did the grief strike them, remembering the wine that had touched their lips the night before? What could they do? What could they do but hide and wait for that grief, that pain, the pain of all his words coming true? What could they do but wait for it to pass so they could move on? In her book, Carry On, Warrior, Glennon Doyle says, Grief is not something to be fixed. It is something to be born together. And when the time is right, there is always something that is born from it. After real grief, we are reborn as people with a wider and a deeper vision and a greater compassion for the pain of others. We know this is true of our disciples. Once they were able to pass through this grief, this grief of the moment that they lived through, they lived into a wider vision and a great compassion for this world. They went on, they taught, and they lived, and they spoke about the one that they loved and lost. That we are a people that live in that grief today. And on many other days in our lives. And we want to hide from it just as the disciples did. We want it to wash over us or rush like wind around us and be gone. But that's not how grief works. It sits like a stone heavy in our hearts and our stomachs, and we cannot escape it by hiding away. This day, on Good Friday, we are called to give in to the pain and the grief that lives within us. We are called to face it head on, no matter how much we would rather it be wind rushing past us. Because the only way to get to the other side of this gift of grief, grief in the death of our Savior, in the death of our loved ones, death of relationships, the death of our former selves, or any other number of things that shatter us into a million pieces, is to hold the stone of grief and face it. We hold this stone, which is a gift from God. It's a gift to be able to know that we are alive, even if it doesn't feel like it. We know that we are alive and that we have this gift of gr grief by the gift of grace. Jesus spread grace and remained within grace while he was in grief that horrible day. We know he could have fought or protested or ran away, but he had grace to hold love in his heart and face the grief of his death. And we have that same strength within us. We have the strength to grant ourselves grace in our times of great grief. Grace to sit with the stone of grief in our hands and to know it's okay that it's there and that we will get through it. Jesus taught us that by grace we are able to bear all things together, and with grace heaping upon grace, all of us from ourselves and to everyone around us, we are able to hold our grief and have the strength to turn our head to the horizon, knowing that our tears of grief will be dried by the dawn soon enough. Sarah Bessie reminds us, as we are waiting for that dawn, that we are a resurrection people, darling. Nothing has been lost that will not be restored. Be patient and be kind with yourself. New life doesn't come overnight, especially after the soil of your life and heart has been burnt down and raised and covered in salt. 
God can take our death and ugliness and bitterness and still make something beautiful and redemptive for you, in you, with you. So this day we sit here under the heavy shadow of this cross, knowing that grief and grace are equally our gifts from our God. We turn from this place to the tomb in hopes that one day we will be the ones knit together in a new life, born out of the grief of our hearts and of our saviors as he was betrayed and mocked and killed. Born also out of the grace that poured from him as he loved and showed and showered his people, God's people, never faltering as he cried his last. And the grace that lives within each of us gathered here today. It is for us to heap on ourselves and onto our family and friends and anybody else that may need some grace to hold their grief. We turn now to the dawn that will not rise today. We turn to the tomb that will not open as we sit in this grief. But we heap grace upon grace and we know that it will come soon enough to make all things new. Until, we remember, until then, we remember that we are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 19. And carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man I said, this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill the scripture that says, they divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothes they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus was his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And then he said to his disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home.
Let us pray. We do not always do a prayer of the people or a prayer of intercession on Good Friday. We are deep within our own grief and seeking the grace of God on this day. We're trying to wade through this story of pain and poise with Jesus as our guide and our focus. Yet we are called to intercede and ask that God's mercy extend beyond ourselves today. We pray for each person gathered here this morning. We pray for our members and our guests joining us virtually. We pray for our community and communities around this country that are faced with economic, social, and societal problems. We pray for all the people that call Canada home. We also pray for those who are trying to call Canada home after leaving their own countries. We pray today for all those touched by war, by famine, by natural disasters. We pray for all those who fear food, home, and job insecurity. We pray for those struggling with mental and physical illnesses. On this most solemn day, God, we pray that your work is felt. Your movement through the Spirit and through the belief in your Son works in those here and anywhere that you are needed. You are with us, God of yesterday, God of today, God of tomorrow. Soften our hearts as we sit under the cross today so we may look towards Easter Sunday with hope. We sit in sorrow as Jesus' death is upon us and we hold fast to the words that you taught us and we love to hear as we sing your Lord's Prayer, calling you by whatever name feels most like home to us this day we sing. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 19. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the body left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. When the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who had been crucified with him, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once the blood and water came out. He who saw this testified, so that you may also believe his testimony is true, and he knows, and that he tells the truth, so that you may also continue to believe. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on to the one whom they have pierced. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 19. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was one of the disciples of Jesus, thought a secret, though a secret one, because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, 
also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Let us pray. Grow protesting from this place. We have witnessed a huge injustice. Go grieving from this place. We have witnessed a mockery of a trial. Go disillusioned from this place. We have witnessed contempt in those who wield power. Go abundantly thankful from this place. For Jesus was tested, Jesus was crucified, but Jesus remained faithful. Go quietly to with your friends, go towards Easter and rejoice in knowing that God, your loving God, goes with you. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Oh